Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this fifth installment of our webinar series on geology and the mining sector. Today, we are going to explore geophysical surveys. Uh, I'm here with our host, Francine Falara. Um, before uh, moving into today's presentation, just want to remind you guys, if you have uh, any questions during the course of this presentation, just type them in the chat box on the, the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll compile these questions and answer them later. Um, also, if uh, you want to go back and revisit the previous lessons, you can do so on our YouTube page. Um, the first three lessons are available online. The fourth is coming soon, and this fifth one will be available soon as well. Um, I think that will be it for now. Uh, Francine, the floor is yours. Thank you. So welcome to this new lesson. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, okay, so, so just to do a little intro, um, geophysical surveys. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people understood that uh, geophysics is a main brain branch in uh, geology and is a complete uh, different entity. Uh, geophysicians are professionals that uh, take data uh, on the field, interpret their data, and uh, we use that data to complete our geological interpretations. So the geophysical surveys go hand in hand with the field surveys, but each uh, ha are individual domains. So if we move on. Uh, so block two, lesson two, the geophysical surveys. It was, it is separated into four main blocks, uh, a little intro to geophysics, an overview of the field techniques, uh, how the ge geophysical data is used and how we use the uh, geophysic interpretations uh, superposed to the uh, geological surveys. So just to start basic uh, definition, what is geophysics? So geophysics, what you have to remember is used mainly to study the physics of the earth by measuring and collecting the earth's uh, physical properties, data such as its shape, its gravitational and magnetic field, and anything that has to do with internal structure and composition. So here is a simple uh, smoothed uh, image of the Earth's gravity that was draped on an idealized Earth. Just to show um, the distribution of the gravity or gravitation force within the Earth. And gravity is known to everybody as the force which causes objects to fall onto the ground. So that's the basics of uh, geophysics. Applied geophysics is uh, used in many different uh, domains and the main purpose of geophysics has to do with anything to make any profit. So as you see here on the right, um, the uses were separated by domains, uh, mainly uh, geological exploration, engineering and environment. We have smaller subcategories like archaeology forensics, uh, bio, uh, agri agri agriculture, uh, anything to do with glacio, uh, glaciers, and hydrogeology. So mainly for exploration for oil, gas, coal, minerals, uh, search for groundwater, uh, ground properties, characterization for anything to do with uh, infrastructures for uh, geoengineering, so tunnels, stands, uh, etc. Geophysical arc is used also for archaeology to find artifacts, geophysical geology, and also for everything that has to do with environment. So geophysics is mainly used to better understand geological processes such as plate tectonics, magmas, volcanism, and rock formation. 
An example here on a world map scale, we have the distribution of the plate tectonics as we've seen them in block one, lesson one, and uh, the geophysical map that is overlaid on these uh, plate tectonics to show the areas where, where uh, there's a higher density and lower densities, et cetera. So geophysical surveys, the definition, geophysical surveys are geological methods used uh, using ground-based physical sensing techniques to produce detailed images or maps of an area. So there are many different methodologies and these methods are neither invasive or, or destructive. So that's important to remember because the goal here of the geophysical surveying it can be used within culturally sensitive sites since it doesn't mostly does not damage the environment. It measures the intensity of waves or force fields as they pass through different geological materials and it illustrates unpredicted variations or deviations from normal, what we call the normal or the background noise and pinpoints are out anything that has to do with anomalies. So they could be local or regional anomalies. And finally, these, uh, the, the geological interpretations are based on the basis of these anomalies. So geophysics and geology works hand in hand. Why geologists use geophysical surveys? Well, they usually use it, use it where they cannot get direct access to rocks. So either to identify resources without sampling or dis disturb disturbing their surfaces, to detect um, buried features and difficult to reach areas, or without uh, causing any excavation. When they are studying both small scale and large areas, uh, looking respectively, respectively, sorry, respectively for local or regional anomalies, to test if minerals or metals are present beneath the surface. They also use geophysical surveys when they know what they are looking for. So that's a knowledge driven approach. Differentiating granitic intrusions from massive sulfides using their known densities. Uh, they want to validate their geological interpretations and models. So within advanced uh, geological interpretations, the geophysical surveys uh, interpretations are uh, very important. These techniques can only estimate the geology based on the data interpretations. So this is just a simplified um, image to start to get to know uh, geophysics slowly. Um, because usually in geophysics is either um, t uh, the, the training is either done with the background of geophysics, which is purely mathematical, or understanding how the technique works on the field. So that's the approach I, I use today because we want to understand how the geophysical surveys help during exploration phases. So if someone is walking, if a geology, geologist or technician is walk, walking on the field, here, as you can see, the geology, the background here is all green. There's nothing that changes, nothing apparent from what's going on from the underground. So the geophysics helps the geologist uh, to illustrate or understand what's going on underground that is not seen on the surface. So most of the techniques when they are ground-based or, or air-based is that they project uh, sound waves, shock waves, uh, uh, electricity, any kind of, depending on the technique. And these will uh, grow within the depth and the response or the measures will vary uh, within one lithology, within sub lithologies or presence of ore, mineralization, presence of faults, etc. And the difference also between um, lower lithologies that don't appear on the surface so they are used to help the geologist understand the uh, continuation of a geology underground. The 
same uh, theory as last week, uh, sorry, two weeks ago when we learned uh, the uh, cartography surveys, the scales are very important. The geophysical analysis can be done on two different scales. Same thing as the geological surveys. It's either a small scale or large scale. Small scale, either within one drill hole or within a, a, a very uh, short or a small area uh, where something, something specific has to be detailed. So either using seismic surveys within shallow depths Large scale is when we are not familiar with an area and we need to uh, extract the general trends or orientations or lithological uh, composition of rocks. So this is the first step that's done in a large area to cover as much as we can. So it can either be done um, on the ground or aerial surveys or on the water surveys. Just a reminder of what is magnetism for a rock, so you will understand the rest of the lesson. So magnetization is directed according to the Earth's magnetic field and is hence proportional to it. So susceptibility or the sensibility of a rock depends on the magnetic mineral content found in that rock. So it is basically uh, found within magnetite or pyrolytite minerals. And within the lesson one of block one, we have seen that mafic and ultramafic rocks have a higher concentration of magnetite than felsic, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. So that's important also to remember when we are using geophysical data. Geologists often use aeromagnetic data to develop diagrams that map out the contacts that exist between these contrasting geological units. So that's the first step a geologist can do before putting foot on the field and becoming familiar of the area's geology. The geophysical survey types uh, vary. Um, they each have different applications and equipment and each can go to uh, various depths. They are basically um, separated into three, air-based or airborne, ground-based, and uh, diamond drill holes or bore holes. The geophysical surveys applications, uh, they, uses, they use physical techniques such as seismic, gravitational, magnetic, electrical, and electromagnetic to measure the Earth's physical properties used to illustrate areas with anomalies. Exploration geophysics is used by geologists to map the surface, the subsurface of a chosen region to define mainly the underlying geological structures. So to validate whatever surface observations they have of structures, faults, faults, etc. The geometry of the intrusive rocks, like plutons, intrusions, and dikes, and also to pinpoint anomalies that could show potential economic mineral deposits, areas um, uh, rich either in precious metals like gold or base, base metals like copper and zinc. So we're going to start with the airborne geophysical survey types. Uh, these are mainly used, as I said before, with uh, larger scales surveys and mainly during prospecting and early exploration stages uh, within areas where there's not much information known by the geologist. Even if we are doing airborne geophysics, we are making or taking the measures using what we call surveyed in grids, where we're going to see them later on. Um, the airborne used either the plane or helicopter or drone is going to follow specific grid lines in the air, which will be able to import within uh, GIS layers with their coordinates. So the main airborne techniques are magnetic surveys, radiometrics surveys, 
gravimetric surveys and ele electromagnetic surveys. The disadvantage of aeromagnetic surveys is that they have or produce lower resolution than ground-based geophysical surveys. So they cannot be used to locate drill hole targets. They are only done as a first phase interpretation. Here we can see the different, the three different techniques that exist nowadays by plane, by helicopter, and by a drone. Drones, it's, it's been only for the past five years, about roughly, and um, it is still to be tested. It is used mainly now in areas that are difficult to go physically, but it's still a challenge um, because the drones are not as um, strong to support these heavy systems. So the airborne geophysical surveys are conducted from helicopters or light aircraft in a grid pattern. They are plus, they, these surveys are possible to cover large inaccessible areas without requiring any line cutting. So it reduces the cost for large area geophysical surveys. Um, uh, the advantages for the aeromag surveys they're mainly used by government geological services for land use development and planning and for large area coverage. They're used by mining and oil exploration companies for hydrogeological, hydro geological, environmental, archaeological, and even military research. The aeromag geophysical surveys consist of measuring the intensity of geomagnetic field in order to detect local magnetic variations from the rocks. Resulting aeromag data is used to support geological formations, mapping to detect any concentration, concentration of magnetic minerals, hence showing any anomalies. The methodology is mainly to have magnetometers that are fixed to in, onto an aircraft, a helicopter, or a drone that flies over the area by performing a series of equidistance linear pathways to collect magnetic measurements. So the equidistance linear pathways are what we call a grid. So we have a virtual grid when we are on the air, and we have a grid or cut lines when we are on the ground. The directions of the lines is generally perpendicular to the geological structures of the area of a study, as we have seen uh, within the uh, cartography surveys. It's the same principle when we do uh, across sections, we all, always do it perpendicular to the geological structures. The data is processed to produce profiles, maps, and models that geologists will use to complete their interpretation. This is a picture of a drone set up with the, uh, with the surveys. So these um, are now able to sample high resolution data compared to those of ground geophysical surveys and do so at a lower cost and without having to resort to line cutting. Uh, how are the aeromag surveys used? Uh, mainly uh, directly or indirectly to identify several different types of deposits and are especially effective in detecting any kind of air, iron deposits, titanium deposits, everything that has that is related to the kimberlitic types, so for the diamond deposits, the bauxite deposits, and the rare earth elements as tantalum and niobium which are linked with the carbonate rock. They're also used to identify and locate uh, the deposits that are associated to chromium and nickel, uh, which are found in ultramafic rocks. Everything that has to do with the VMS, the volcanogenic massive sulfides, which are mainly the base metals, uh, copper and zinc, with some possible gold and silver deposits. And finally, for the porphyry copper and iron copper uh, gold oxide deposits, 
uh, as found as type uh, the Olympic Dam. We then move on to the ground-based geophysical surveys. These uh, include many different uh, types. I'm going to try to cover them uh, as simply as I can. So from the ground, we have the seismology. So it's the study of the natural uh, from earthquakes or the man-made seismic waves. We have the magnetic surveys, which are basically the analysis of variations in Earth's magnetic field and measured within induced rock magnetism anomalies. We have the electric surveys with the resistivity and the VES uh, soundings. Um, we have the radiometric surveys with the radioactive decay, isotopes, and dating. Gravity surveys, which is the study of variations in the Earth's gravitational field and density contrasts. We have the induced polarity, which is known as the IP. We have the electromagnetic EM surveys, which uh, studies um, the induction of electromagnetic fields, ground penetrating radar, the GPR surveys, and the magnetotelerics, the MT. Finally, we have the borehole surveys, the LIDAR and the geothermal methods, which include everything that has to do with heat flow, temperature, and ground conduction. These uh, surveys can be separated into either passive methods. The passive methods measure spatial variations of static or natural fields of force. There are lateral subsurface material variations give rise to spatial variations in the field. And there is um, an inherent ambiguity in interpretation. That means uh, they can result in multiple solutions. So um, some, these have, we have to be careful because we have to know, use them when we know more our geology than in areas where the geology is less known. So these comprise magnetic surveys, gravity surveys, and radioactivity. The active methods, uh, they measure the wave field characteristics. So they travel the travel times of elastic waves and amplitude and phase of electromagnetic waves. They use the energy uh, that is introduced into the subsurface. So they use source and detector controlled techniques. And there is less inherent ambiguity in interpretation. So they offer fewer solutions. So they are more precise. So these include the seismic surveys, the electrical surveys, and the electromagnetic surveys. How do we collect the geophysical data? Basically, uh, the example here is for ground-based geophysical surveys which are conducted from the ground. And uh, we begin by marking off the site into survey grids. A grid is created on the land referred to as line cutting, which are marked by narrow cut lines in the forest or by a line of pickets on an open land. The reference points placed along the corners of each grid mark the collected data and they help to minimize the positioning errors. So we have coordinates for every point of measures. So these coordinates are either are the known as the X and Y, if we have a 2D surface measures, X being our easting, east and west, and Y being our northing, north and south. If we add a third dimension, which is in depth within a borehole, we would have a Z coordinate, which would be the elevation. The surveyors will walk and carry the geophysical instruments along the grid and taking detailed geophysical readings and measurements at regular intervals. Uh, additional detailed field work, including the geological map and uh, trenching. So trenching is basically uh, digging a, a along a ditch in the ground to examine the geology are all used to uh, complement the geophysical data. Um, the data, uh, how the geophysical data is processed, the data will be processed and by imaging and these 
will be converted uh, convert the raw numeric data into interpretable maps. So the geophysical data may be rendered as graphics. So these will help to recognize cultural and natural patterns. They will vi help to visualize physical features and also help to interpret the causes of any detected anomalies. So we're gonna start with the ground-based surveys. I with, I'm going to go over um, uh, the methods. So we're going to start with the seismic surveys. Seismic surveys involve placing geophones. So the geophones are the sensors that are connected to the wires and strategic, strategic patterns to provide information about the properties of the rocks several kilometers below the earth. The survey team will induce vibrations using truck mountain vibrating weights or small explosives. So the vibrations from either weights or explosives are recorded with geophones to provide information about the properties of the rocks. The vibration is measured as it is passed through layers of the earth. So this here, as we can see on the right, is a simplified image of any ground-based seismic survey. So we have at the top, this one will be caused by a, ground, by a truck that would cause the vibrations. We have what we call the refraction and the reflected waves. So the reflect, refracted waves are the ones that are induced by either the truck or by an explosion, by a blast. And then these will be reflected to uh, the surface and it is the time the distance taken to for these waves to travel that will show the difference in the layers if we are changing from one to another lithology and if we are uh, finding any oil or gas traps and any structures so basically this is it so the reflection seismology which is called seismic in the minerals industry is the practice of inducing vibration in the earth's surface and analyzing the reflection. So the vibration is induced using a vibration machine, like a truck, a vibro truck, or using dynamites to, uh, with blasts. These creates a seismic wave that travels to the earth's metal, and the, which is the ball of molten rock below our feet. And the mantle reflects the wave back up to the surface, and these are measured. So this is a simplified way to see seismic surveys. Seismic surveys, the types of waves that uh, go through the ground, are separated into three kinds, the primary, the secondary, and the long waves. The seismic surveys uh, help to rebuild 3D images of the Earth's interior by what we call seismic tomo tomography. And these uses the heat effects on the seismic waves, uh, which will produce different wave velocities or speed and will help to define the interior of the Earth. So on the ground, on the, on the, on the left, here, because we don't have any trees, we don't need to do any line cutting, but we need to flag the lines anyway for the truck to be able to follow that regular grid. So we have the technicians going over, flagging the grid lines. And on the right, you see a vibro size truck, which is um, moving along and inducing vibrations. And here you can see how the vibrations are done on the surface of the ground. Once we have one of these vibration, we have what we call a reflection and refraction data. And these produce uh, profiles that are seen here. So it is measured in time, microseconds. And these, whatever changes occur below the surface will vary in the wave form shape and time and we have major differences either between uh, 
geological units or we have major information of structural uh, uh, structures present in an area between two lithologies. So when we have a grid, we have a series of these profiles. And once we have a series of these profiles, as we can see here, this image is the best representation of what's going on. So when we are here on the field, the geology, geological surveys are done, we trace a grid where we need to have more information or validation. So we prepare the geological, the geophysical grid. This grid, once is done, um, the uh, seismic surveys are done. Once the seismic surveys are done, we have a series of raw data, which is transformed into uh, imagery. The pixels of that imagery is represented along a legend, as we've seen within the field cartography lesson. The legends are important to know what's going on on our map. Over here, the uh, basically on most geological maps, uh, geophysical maps, sorry, whatever is background, blue, um, non-anomatic, and whatever is uh, warmer colors, orange, red, pinks, indicate higher densities, anomalies, and uh, things we are looking for, for breaks either between different ethologies or structures. Once these um, profiles are interpreted by the geophysician, it is given to the geologist where the geologist will take that information and will uh, precise or adjust the defined contacts, smooth it out to the geophysical interpretation. So basically that's how it works in that cycle. And this is a perfect example on how the geology and the geophysics surveys are working hand in hand. So this is a typical example of a seismic survey. So these seismic surveys, uh, when someone sits down and processes them on the computer, will be able to trace the differences in the responses. Some of them are very drastic, while others are more locally uh, uh, smaller anomalies. And we have things here going on that we can see that is either breaking or stopping the continuity of a wave. So once we have several of these profiles, uh, softwares are used to interpret these differences in the profiles, either horizontally, uh, vertically, or diagonally, where anything that has uh, a break in continuation or is cut by another structure. So where does the seismic surveys are used? Mainly for hydrocarbons, uh, for oil, gas, coal, where they occur in horizontal stratified sedimentary rocks. So there are some traps that is uh, done within these beds and they will be able to show the original biomass like forest or grasslands that were covered up in layers of rocks. These layers are easy to spot with a seismic wave and allow ge geologists to easily pinpoint any variations in the layers that might contain hydrocarbons. For hard rock environments, they are not useful because the minerals tend to occur below the sedimentary layers uh, in igneous solidified magma or metamorphosed heat transformed rocks. So, so for hard rock environments, uh, which are often extremely complex and are much more difficult to analyze seismically, uh, we cannot use that method. Unfortunately, due to its popularity in the oil and gas industries, there are a lot of geologists that try to use it anyway. Uh, by applying the techniques for the oil and gas industry and which are not very good for exploring for minerals. For environment, it is not good uh, too because the vibration, especially when caused by dynamite, may have uh, many negative environmental effects 
on the study area. Moving on to the GPR or the ground penetrating radar surveys. Uh, this radar signal is an electromagnetic pulse that is directed into the ground. The subsurface objects cause reflections in the data and the travel time indicates the depth of the object. So the GPR is best utilized in sandy soils without a lot of clay, silts or material that will cause metallic interference. Um, in a rocky terrain or heterogeneous sediments, it can further cause problems. So this is an example of a ground where it is mainly sand, uniform sand, using the instrument and again, using a perfect systemic, systematical grid. Here, the grid is every one meter. We have um, the measures and the, these measurements were transformed and interpreted into an uh, imagery map. Moving on to the ground-based magnetic surveys. Magnetic surveys uh, specify variations of the Earth's magnetic field due to the presence of magnetic minerals. Small variations in the magnetic content of specific metals allow technicians to interpret rock types and assist in identifying resources. The magnetometers provide better resolution of small near surface features. They respond strongly to iron and steel, brick, burned soil, and many types of rock. It's even possible to detect very subtle anomalies caused by disturbed soils or decayed organic materials like from a long ago campfire. So this is uh, used also a lot in forensics uh, investigations. The ground-based magnetic survey, this is an example of a ground-based map, uh, which is uh, used a lot in the geological exploration and uh, is much more complicated and precise than the gravity surveys. So geologists use variations uh, in the Earth's magnetic field to detect certain magnetic magnetized ores and precipitated minerals. And these, as you can see, can help us also define uh, the geometry of our geological features and main uh, fractures or structures. It's Magnetic surveys may be useful for minerals. So in particular, it is good for finding minerals hidden in complex rock formations and precipitated minerals, metals that have already been smelted from the ore state by the heat in the Earth's crust. And they shine particularly bright on magnetic scans. Useful for uh, iron ore prospecting, iron formations, um, chromit and manganese prospecting, everything to do with sulfide occurrences uh, that are associated with magnetite uh, and or pyrotite, and finally for the diamonds. They are usually used also, uh, very useful also for the geological mapping of lithology. So they help precise and validate any structural mapping such as faults, fractures, shear, shear zones, and folds. They are very useful in structurally hosted deposits, such as uranium conglomerates and stratiform lead and zinc deposits. And they are useful for depth to bedrock to determine thickness of sedimentary sections and overburden. This is a good example, uh, as you can see, on, on the top, you have a 2D surface cartography. So the sediments here, this is taken in a BTB. So it is the break between the Cadillac sediments and the uh, upper volcanic, volcano sedimentary belt, separated by the uh, well-known Cadillac fault. So a geologist walking on the ground on the top here will only purely see uh, the sediments. If we didn't do the ge geophysical surveys, these final anomalies and uh, shape would not be seen at the surface, which are uh, phenomena phenomen that are occur at depth that cannot be seen at the surface. So the magnetic anomalies represents a heterogeneity of composition and or structure 
within the Earth, which cannot, which cannot be observed at the surface during mapping surveys. A good example here from the Jutel area, where we had done a 3D geological model of the area, which was pretty easy. As you can see, most of the surfaces were constructed, uh, as we call, uh, sub-vertical or dipping at almost 90 degrees, so going from the surface straight down. And we wanted to validate these uh, contacts because we didn't have a lot of outcrops on the field to take measurements and uh, to have variations in the different lithologies. So uh, magnetic data was, uh, survey was done on the field. These were inverted in the Jutel area and then both um, models were superposed. And as we can see here, we see right away that there is a difference between what we had defined on the field and what the geophysics is defining. So this is either um, that we have to redefine our contact or within our main contact here, there is a, a subunit that was not seen on the field, a lack of outcrops. So here is a good example on how the uh, magnetic surveys can help validate a ge geological uh, model. So what is it useful for? First, uh, it is cost effective and the, re the response resolution is pretty high. So inexpensive equipment and very straightforward survey procedures, the high resolution and cost effective for detail or reconnaissance surveys is very useful for comp complementary data enhances and interpretation of other geophysical surveys and the highly sophisticated processing and interpretation tools is very useful to a geologist. Um, the only uh, thing to be aware is for low experienced geologists um, beca because of the magnetic surveys weak and ambiguous responses of at low latitudes, uh, the magnetic maps can be uh, very complicated and require advanced training to, to properly interpret them. Just a little, a little uh, slide showing uh, radio radiometric surveys. Uh, these, they measure the gamma rays that are continuously emitted from the earth via natural decomposition of common radio radiogenic materials. You can therefore assess gamma radiation from the top, only from the top 30 centimeters of the ground. So these are used for specific reasons and uh, they may be performed from the air or directly on the top of the ground to identify metallic and industrial minerals. Moving on to the gravity surveys. Gravity survey. Gravity is the most underutilized geophysical method that is very effective when used properly, especially in parallel with other methods. So a gravimetic survey provides diagno di diagnostic information on variations in soil density and allows the presence of a deficit or an excess of mass to be identified with respect to the regional gradient. As explorers learn about a deposit footprint, additional information provided by gravimetric surveys becomes essential to the development of a, va a valid and rigorous 3D geological models. So at the scale of the deposit, when a conductive and or polarizable and or magnetic source is found, it becomes essential to determine if there is an excess of mass to evaluate the chances of success. So the gravity service, they use a gravimeter to measure the gravity field to determine variations in rock density. A, te a technician will, will take some gravity measurements during set intervals of distance and record the precise height at each location. These surveys are used to identify areas that have mineral or energy source deposits. Example here on the field. So gravity exploration is a passive exercise that has no environmental effects. The geologists will measure the variations in the Earth's gravitational field, adjusting the polar flattening, the rotation of the Earth, and the gravitational impacts of the sun and the moon. The remaining variations show dense formations in the hard rock. So basically, it is the 
variation within the rock densities that will help uh, interpret the gravity surveys. So this is an example of the data taken on the field. If we go for the uses, useful for oil, for the oil industry, gravity can find all the oil deposits with spectacular accuracy because again, uh, because of the difference in densities. The airborne gravity surveys can find likely areas for exploration. The ground surveys can find the perfect place to drill. They are also very useful for gems. The gravity is often used to find diamonds and other precious stones which are have higher densities. For the use for, their, for geological mapping, uh, validated using geophysics for the gravity surveys. Here is an example again back to Abitibi in the Hawaii area around the Horn Mine. So at the top here we have the uh, field cartography and with the geological interpretations of the different units and the main faults. And we have uh, here the line that was taken for the gravity survey and how the different gravity measurements are done or resulting from the difference in each mythology or difference in colors that you see here. We can see it better here if we move from northwest to southeast, which is our cross section here. We can see the difference in the density measures as we crisscross different uh, mythologies. So the gravity modeling provides structural compositional models to help extrapolate and visualize the geological context at great depth. They are a useful tool to quickly estimate the geometry of the source of gravitational anomalies. They are used for interpretation of the geology surveyed at the surface. They are ideal if geological sections exist to compare the proposed model to the actual geology and gain a better understanding of the physical property of the source. So, an example here on the surface with the, the interpreted geology, uh, with here we had four main uh, faults. So if we go across that profile, that grid with our gravity surveys, we can see the difference in gravity measurements at depth, this is the surface, as if you, we were walking on that line here, and at depth, with the gravity survey, what it gives us is a more precise um, picture of our geological contacts, how they go in depth, and their geometry, and where they are cut, if they are cut, and if our faults, how our faults are uh, dipping, and so on. So, um, a, a good example was here for the Cadillac fault where everybody thought that along, um, along the entire fault, it would dip mostly uh, towards the north. The gravity uh, survey here um, made us see that a part of the Cadillac fault would also have a dip towards the south. So this would not be seen uh, on the surface. A general idea also uh, is how the gravity surveys are used to define or precise our 3D geometry of our intrusions. It is really useful for that. So again, we just superpose our um, field cartography with the known geology with the, uh, ge the gravity survey and we, f we edit our contacts with our densities. So if we zoom out again here, we can see how both, again, field and density uh, models can be used hand in hand to uh, precise the geology on the field. Again, here, this would be for a deposit without any depth information, with only the surface information, we were doing a rough deposit 3D surface, but with the geological uh, gravity survey, we were able to pinpoint the exact shape of the deposit. This is the same deposit. 
And within a deposit, once we have the shape of the deposit, if we push it forward using the gravity uh, density, we can also uh, separate a deposit uh, with the areas that are richer either in pyrite, copper, and zinc in this situation because the pyrite, copper, and zinc have different densities. So we can even push it forwards in our interpretation. So the gravity surveys are not useful for certain mineral deposits because some minerals occur in distributions with little resemblance to the patterns in the hard rock and are hard to see by gravity. We're moving on to the induced polarity, so the IP surveys. The induced polarity IP surveys induce an electrical field in the ground and quantify the conductivity and resistivity of the subsurface. They help uh, identifying changes in the electrical currents, allowing technicians to identify changes caused by different rocks and minerals. These surveys are used to find metal metallic minerals. Uh, used for, again, especially for geological exploration, so to detect disseminated metal, metal, metallic luster minerals within veins or gold structures, to detect any disseminated sulfides or veinlets around uh, VMS, so base metals, copper and zinc, and to discriminate any uh, non-mineralized conductors such as faults and shear zones. They are so very useful to detect low or non-conductive solid uh, sulfides, uh, either rich in sphalerite, discontinu discontinuous uh, strips, isolated sulfides, and into so uh, stock work. They are mainly used also for mapping uh, alteration zones and structural elements controlling mineralization such as porphyry copper systems, and are also very useful for mapping clay minerals which are uh, often associated with kimberlites. Moving on to the EM surveys, the main goal of electromagnetic geophysical prospecting in the mining industry is based on variations in relative subsurface conductivity, is to detect deposits that conduct electricity. These formations are detected using the principle of induction as they would be by a current transformer, so using electricity. So the usual process is to put a transmitter, a transmitter on the surface. That transmitter will produce a strong primary magnetic field that varies over time and penetrates more or less deeply into the subsurface. These are called the eddy currents and are induced in conductors that are excited by this primary field. Uh, these in turn, they will produce the so-called secondary electromagnetic field and will be detected on the surface or in boreholes by a probe connected to a receiver. So this is the instrument. So the surveys are induce, uh, will induce an electrical magnetic field to measure 3D variations in conductivity within the near surface rock and soil. These measurements, they may be used to locate metallic minerals and to explore groundwater and salinity patterns of certain region. In geology, changes in underground conductivity may indicate buried features. Conductivity measures respond strongly to metal. So there we have to be careful because in some areas, this could be a disadvantage because uh, when the metal is extraneous to geological features, uh, it was sometimes used and found some anomalies that were uh, related to fuel drum tank that were abandoned on the field or any thing or tool that was abandoned on the field and later on recovered. So it can be useful when the metal is of geological interest, but we have to be careful to make sure anomalies are geoph geological. So the types of conductors detected using the EM were separated into three categories, superficial, present in rock, or artificial. So the superficial conductors are everything that has to do with um, overburden leg bottoms and stream beds. Uh, conductors in rocks uh, can be explained either by graphite, sulfide deposits, magnetic deposits, 
shear and fault zones, and ultramafic rocks such as serpentine peridotite. What we have to be careful is the artificial conductors, which can be related to metal tanks, metal conduits, waste, pipelines, uh, railways, and high voltage lines. Uh, the, the, the fields that are using EM surveys are mainly for mining, environmental, civil engineering, and hydrogeology. In geology, EM surveys are useful for structural studies to detect the faults or fractures, for unearthing cavities, for estimating the thickness of alluvial cover, and finding groundwater streams and locating graphite and sulfide or magnetic deposits. So instruments, example of these instru instruments on the field, the EM surveys are separated into uh, sub um, techniques. The, VL, the VLF is known as the very low frequency EM. So this is a passive method which uses permanent transmission antennas to detect either surface conductors or structure boundaries such as faults and fractures. They can be used in various environments since it does not use local transmitter and they use the same transmission frequencies of the uh, submarines, so very low frequencies for radio transmissions. Example on the field of the VLF are still used mainly within the uh, uh, Great North area uh, because they are low cost, they, ha they have rapid techniques and the reconnaissance techniques is very quick, quick and the equipment is not uh, very um, uh, is is a uh, not uh, heavy. That's the word I was looking. It's not very heavy. Um, we have the EMH and the EMV. The EMH H is just for horizontal and V for vertical. So they are used to map conductors at shallow depths lower than a hundred meters. The method is relatively simple and inexpensive to carry out. And finally, the TDEM, which is on the ground and in borehole, used to measure the conductive response of the subsurface and to locate conductive bodies such as economic sulfide deposits uh, for the nickel copper or the VMS, copper zinc, gold, and silver. They are also used for barren sulfides, graphitic sediments, and the saline fluids. The conductance of a deposit depends on its mineralogy texture and thickness, and the shape of TDEM response is influenced by the conductor's position and size. So this is an example of these conductors taken in boreholes, the different boreholes here along the topological profile. Everything that has uh, with the colder bluish colors represents resistive material. Everything within warmer um, colors, reddish, is conductive material. So once we have a series of boreholes, the geophysician can interpret uh, continuous uh, bodies that are more conductive versus those that are more resistive. So where do the TDM is useful for? For detection of conductors from the surface. Uh, such as sulfide lenses, faults, shear zones, kimberlets, for field tracking of airborne survey anomalies. They are mainly used within the Browns field, uh, which is uh, prospecting periphery of existing deposits or well-known mature mining camps, and within the Green field, which is recognition surveys through the use of uh, effective loop configurations uh, within exploration field. Uh, wide spacing lines and detailed field decisions. Mainly for VMS, for uranium deposits, and for diamond hosting kimberlets. Uh, the borehole surveys, how is it done? Well, mainly we, we need to have a, to drill a hole. We need to gather the information about the rocks within the hole. Uh, we can use different methods such as magnetic, radiometric, electrical, and also gravity. Uh, 
mainly used, the borehole surveys are mainly used for geological exploration again, again to find out the, uh, the veins or gold structures, um, for detecting any disseminated sulfides or veinlets for uh, VMS, for discrimination of non-mineralized conductors such as faults and shear zones, for, non, for low or non-conductive solid sulfides, again with the either rich in sphalerite, discontinuous uh, zones, isolated sulfide grains, or stock works. Also excellent for mapping alteration zones and structural elements such as porphyry copper systems and mapping clay minerals that could be associated with kimberlites. Finally, uh, the resistivity mapping to determine is used to determine either the alteration or the depth of a basin and the selection of the best electrode configuration for recognition depth of penetration or detailed mapping of targets. Example here of these difference between resistivity and conductivity within different types of rocks, different types of glacier deposits and different types of water grounds. So this is just uh, an example of the resistivity within the tomography of the earth and how it can vary from what we can see on the surface. Once we have a series of these profiles and these profiles are mixed or put together, we can define, here is an example of a hydrostr hydrostratigraphic basin, which is completely interpreted with these profiles. Finally, for the LIDAR, which is the light radar surveys, is mainly an optical remote sensing technology, which measures the distance to a target by illuminating the target with light using pulses from a laser. A laser. The light LIDAR has many applications in geology, mainly for planning field campaigns and for mapping indistinguishable features on the ground. The main use is within high vegetation uh, areas. The LIDAR helps geologists to create higher resolution digital elevation models, the DEEMs, of sites that reveal microtopography that are otherwise hidden by vegetation. This is an example of a LIDAR survey that can be done either by uh, aerial surveys or ground surveys. So um, this comes from the Burjex Inc., which is a mining consultant company from the US. Uh, I like that picture because it would regroup uh, most of the techniques shown today, showing the geophysical exploration for field um, mineral exploration uh, and how it helps to identify the ore bodies. So each are well documented. Within Quebec, we have uh, BTB Geophysics, which are, their offices are located in Val and now they have an office too in Thunder Bay in Ontario. And they have a very good website where they explain most of the techniques and uh, how they are done and why are they used. So I included here their lexicon. So you can go and uh, click on any elements that you are curious to know which method would be used. So example here for gold. If you click on gold, then we ha you have another window that opens and it will explain which methods are better for gold exploration. Another example here are for the base metal, the VMS, and which they would say which method would be better either at a big scale or a small scale. So to complete today's lesson, uh, we're gonna visualize uh, a couple of videos to understand how these techniques are done simply. Just gonna go out of here. Okay. I'm gonna change my sharing screen.
Seismic imaging, sometimes called reflection seismology, is an exploration method that estimates the seismic characteristics of the Earth's subsurface. The technology measures reflected acoustic energy waves and is mostly used for coal, oil and gas and geothermal exploration. Seismic imaging provides geophysicists and geologists a method of mapping the subsurface structure of rock formations. Geophysicists and geologists interpret the data to map structural features that could potentially contain minerals, hydrocarbons or hot rock resources. The Earth's upper crust is composed of many layers of rocks and minerals that all have different properties such as hardness, density and porosity. The placement and orientation of these layers give clues as to the likelihood of finding mineral, hydrocarbon or hot rock reserves nested within them. Changes in properties between different rocks can cause reflection and or refraction of sound waves. Seismic imaging works by sending acoustic energy waves created from a sound source through these layers and then recording how long a reflected sound wave took to be received by a microphone. This data tells geophysicists and geologists where rock properties change, thus helping find oil and gas deposits. Typically, there are two methods for producing the source sound waves. One is by using a vibrosize and the other is by using an explosive detonation. A vibrosize is also known as a thumper or a shaker unit. It is a large hydraulic ram that is fitted to a special truck. The operator stops the truck at a location where they would like to generate a signal and uses the vibrosize to ram the ground, thus creating a series of source waves. Microphones, called geophones, that have been specially placed in an array around the survey area pick up the reflected sound waves and record that data to a digital medium for later computer analysis. Sometimes, instead of using a vibrosize, explorers will use an explosive like dynamite to create the source wave. Explosives are placed beneath the earth in shallow drill holes. When the explosives are detonated, an acoustic shock wave travels through the ground and is detected by an array of geophones that have been previously arranged. Because scientists know how long it takes for sound waves to travel through and bounce back from different types of rocks and minerals, careful interpretation of seismic data can give geophysicists and geologists detailed cross-sections and three-dimensional graphics of the subsurface of a surveyed area. This can help them find mineral, hydrocarbon and hot rock resource deposits. So the next method we'll see will be the gravity surveys. Gravity surveying measures the change of rock density by looking at changes in gravity. This technology gravity is mostly in the, the change of rock density and oil and gas changes industry. in gravity. Gravity this surveying provides geophysicists, geologists and exploration managers with a picture of the subsurface geology of a surveyed area so they can see what's underground. Like all matter, the Earth generates a gravity field that can be measured using specific instrumentation. From our perspective, the Earth exerts a constant pull of gravity, which we experience as things either falling or being held to the ground. However, the force of gravity is not the same all over the world. It varies at different points on the Earth. Things like mountains, ocean trenches, tidal movements, even large buildings and structures can affect the Earth's local gravity field. These, as well as the composition of elements within the Earth's crust, all cause micro variations in gravity all over the Earth. Geophysicists routinely measure these micro variations using either ground-based or aerial instrument readings taken by a gravitometer. A gravitometer works by recording the downward acceleration of mass from the minute fluctuations of a finely balanced spring within the gravitometer. This device is known as an accelerometer. The accelerometers used in gravitometers are extremely sensitive to small fluctuations in gravity. For ground-based gravity imaging, a portable gravitometer the size of a knee-high box is placed on the ground at sequential points along a predetermined grid. The operator records a reading at each successive point and advances to the next point along the grid either by a utility vehicle or helicopter. Once there are enough readings recorded from the grid, the data is processed by special computer software 
to create a detailed map of the surveyed region. The process gravity maps define regions of rocks and minerals with differing densities by assigning colours along a colour ramp, where the red end of the spectrum indicates more dense rocks and the green end indicates lighter rocks. Interpretation of this data helps geologists and geophysicists gain an understanding of what mineral types and resources may be found in the surveyed area. The next method we will see will be the magnetic, magnetic surveys. Magnetic surveying measures local magnetic field characteristics of a surveyed region. The technology only detects minerals that respond to magnetic fields. Hence, it's used mostly for mineral exploration, but can also be useful for coal and oil and gas exploration. Magnetic surveying provides geophysicists, geologists and exploration managers with a picture of the subsurface mineral makeup of a surveyed area so they can detect specific ore deposits like iron ore and different rock types. The earth is like a giant moving magnet and its molten metal core creates a magnetic field called the magnetosphere that envelopes the earth. Other terrestrial elements such as magnets and iron also create their own magnetic fields that interact with the Earth's magnetosphere. Scientists have studied these interactions and know that different minerals have their own magnetic characteristics. This means an analysis of local above ground magnetic fields can indicate the presence of underground ore deposits or minerals associated with ore deposits. Geophysicists measure existing magnetic fields using either ground-based or aerial instrument readings recorded by a magnetometer. A magnetometer is a passive technology, which means it only listens for magnetic fields that are already there. For ground-based magnetic imaging, a magnetometer is mounted to an operator via a harness and backpack system. A pole extends out from the harness where the magnetic field measurements are detected. The operator continuously records data by walking along a succession of lines, usually spaced between 5 and 50 metres apart. Once there are sufficient readings to cover the survey area, the data is collected and processed by computer software. Magnetic data can also be gathered aerially, using either a light aeroplane or a helicopter. Both aircraft are rigged with a magnetometer in a fibreglass boom, either extending out the front of the aircraft, as is the case with helicopters, or trailing behind the aircraft, as is the case for aeroplanes. The fiberglass boom prevents the aircraft's magnetometer from picking up the magnetic signature of the aircraft chassis. Readings are taken as the aircraft travels along a predetermined flight path. This method of data gathering yields lower spatial resolution than ground-based magnetic imaging, but covers a much wider area, so more terrain can be mapped. Radiometric surveys are run in conjunction with airborne magnetic surveys. Radiometric surveys use a crystal detector which records low level radiation associated with potassium, uranium and thorium in the near surface environment, about 20 centimetres below the surface. Whether sourced from ground based or aerial techniques, the processed magnetic image maps define regions of terrain that may contain magnetic minerals. Careful examination of the data can give geophysicists important clues to what's under the ground and other possible resources that may be present in the surrounding geology. The fourth method we're going to see will be the electromagnetic surveys. Geoscience Australia provides specialist advice responding to some of Australia's most important challenges, including understanding Australia's vast mineral, energy and groundwater resources. We are undertaking new research across Northern Australia to map potential resources buried deep below the Earth's surface. Australia's vast mineral wealth is still concealed underground. Around 80% of our landscape is underexplored. New geoscience information, tools and methods are required to unlock Australia's hidden resource wealth. Geoscience Australia carries out a number of geophysical surveys to investigate where resources are hosted underground. One technique used to identify mineral and groundwater resources is airborne electromagnetic or AEM surveys. 
Through the Exploring for the Future program, Geoscience Australia completed the world's largest AEM survey in the Northern Territory and Queensland. This type of survey is commonly used by industry to aid in mineral and groundwater exploration. An aircraft fitted with special equipment collects data from its sensors that image several hundred metres below the Earth's surface. The data is analysed into a 3D environment to better understand the geology of the survey area. When integrated with other data sets, it can reveal the location of potential mineral formations and map groundwater resources that can support communities, industries and the environment. The results show conductive units that could indicate the presence of mineral deposits, such as nickel and other commodities. This provides explorers new insights and target areas for further investigations. New geoscience data and knowledge increases confidence in exploration investment, helping to grow Australia's resources sector and create more jobs for all Australians. Discover more about exploring for the future on our website. The next video will show uh, actual um, massive anomaly, IP anomaly that was found within the gold exploration of the Gao Ganda West property of Ontario. My name is Dave Gamble and I'm a consulting geologist, a PGO and a QP qualified person for the iMetal Resources Inc. on the Galganda West project located in northeastern Ontario in Canada. Today we are going to be looking at some of the induced polarization or IP ground survey results completed recently in August on Zone 1 and Zone 3 surface gridded areas. Deliverables include 2D colored pseudo sections of field data, 2D colored vertical sections of 3D inverted resistivity and chargeability data profiles, and a third calculated parameter called gold index. So we're now looking at a top view or a plan view of the uh, grid one area. And uh, we're going to show you on this, on this model, just the planned surface view, where we drilled our holes in February. Our, most of our holes were drilled in this dark blue ground uh, that you see, blue-green, over on this where I got my cursor, drilling towards the red masses which are higher chargeability. Uh, most of our holes were uh, drilled uh, above the anomalies uh, at depth and in a gap where there was a low chargeability responses. Our two holes that hit mineralization in holes one and four were drilled into and probably proximal to one of these chargeable areas. Uh, I'm now going to rotate this block model into a 3D mode and we're now looking at from the southwest corner of the block. This block is uh, 1.2 kilometers north-south by 1.2 kilometers east-west and the vertical dimension here is approximately 500 meters. The reds, the purples and the oranges are high chargeable material. The lower areas on the block model are the greens and the blues that uh, have no ch very little chargeability. So let's take a look at moving from south to north. As we progress up through, you can see the large purple masses uh, coalescing and coming together to form a large chargeability anomaly as we progress northwards in the block. Those are strong IP responses, and I'm going to show you what, what these things are when we look at it coming across from the other side. Let's go from east to west. And what we're going to see here clearly is from the main mass that we see on the southern part or in the middle part of the block, we see almost like plumes coming up towards surface. The hydrothermal system is noted on surface as being areas where the lithologies are strongly silicified. There's sericitization, there's pyritization, fine disseminated pyrite, accompanied with gold values, which we saw in some of the drilling that we did in February. On surface, we see the same evidence of that kind of alteration and solidification and pyritization. So much of the purple masses that one looks at in these block models becomes a um, most likely responsible for the development of pyrite mineralization as a chargeable mass. But you can see how far this thing actually goes. 
One more dimension that we're going to look at is going from the top down, the top surface down, and we're going to slowly, incrementally come down and we can see how these chargeable masses are starting to become stronger and stronger as we go with depth. And we wind up putting a large mass at depth well below where we drilled. And this coarse mass, if you look at this block, this block is now showing us almost a, an entire coverage within the central portion of the block, halfway down in the block, 250 meters to 300 meters, of a high chargeable mass almost extending from north to south on the block. Okay, we're on zone three. This is a top view surface plan of the block that we're looking at. And I'm going to show you where we have uh, surface sampling and trenches and uh, cut samples on surface and the high chargeability and low, low chargeability areas in hot colors versus cold colors. Now we're turned into a 3D model uh, at this point looking from the southwest and we see uh, the area where uh, I'm going to put my cursor up on top where we did the sample, the channel sampling and got some values and this is going to be a priority target down the line for this season for drilling. But we're going to look at this target area uh, of the entire block at the moment. Now let's take it from uh, south to north. We're going to start from the south and go to the north and uh, we're going to start to see how that mass is starting to develop into a, a very large mass as we're going up towards the middle of the block and you can start to see even the hydrothermal plume systems that look like they're injecting up into the surface area of the block. As we continue to the north, it continues on, and it's almost like a flame structure coming up to the surface, and it starts to dissipate somewhat as we go to the north end of the block. Going from west to east, and we start to see, again, how the chargeability is uh, continuing across from uh, west to east. We're going to take a look at this block coming down from the top down, and start to see what this is looking like as we go down uh, from surface down to about 500 meters and we can see how the coalescing of this large mass of, of high conductivity uh, and chargeability is coming through portions and southwest portion of the of the uh, block itself. This block is 1.4 kilometers east-west, 1.4 kilometers south and 500 meters approximately vertical. So we're looking at roots to this thing that are pretty pretty substantial. We're looking at a large mass of chargeability that has to be drill tested. Uh, geophysics has uh, afforded us a, a valuable tool to proceed with the exploration phase uh, of drill testing a lot of these anomalies. Thank you. And the last video um, is a summary of most of the lessons we've seen in block one and block two and will this will open also some of the upcoming lessons, but I thought it was a good place to fit it in with all we've learned so far and what's come to, to be uh, upcoming with the uh, next lessons. When you think of mining, you probably think of giant pits in the earth where workers remove valuable metals or gemstones. However, that is the end of a long, difficult, and very expensive process. Before companies can begin to pull valuable metals like copper out of the earth, geologists must first locate these deposits, determine whether they are cost effective to extract, and commit a large amount of capital to opening a new mining operation. The process of locating new minerals is called mineral exploration, which can be divided into three large stages, target identification and investigation, resource evaluation, and development and production. Very few projects make it through all of these stages and get to production. Instead, most are abandoned due to insufficient resources at a particular location. In this lesson, we'll delve further into these stages to learn how geologists locate valuable mineral deposits. In the past, mineral deposits were found by geologists mapping the surface of the earth looking for clues of valuable mineralization. However, because we have been searching for these deposits for hundreds of years, traditional prospecting methods are rarely used, except in some remote locations such as Alaska and Russia. Now most mineral exploration is performed by specialized teams of geologists using modern geophysical techniques, including magnetic and gravity surveys, which we will look at in greater detail later in this lesson. 
Before companies can begin paying for costly surveys, geologists decide on a large area that is likely to have the mineral deposit of interest. This area is normally several thousands of miles across and can stretch across multiple countries. Geologists examine regular maps, geologic maps, and any other geologic data at this stage to attempt to narrow down the area. In the case of valuable metals, geologists are often looking for specific clues, such as minerals and high concentrations of certain elements. For instance, copper often forms from hydrothermal fluids near volcanic activity. Hydrothermal fluid is hot groundwater that circulates through the bedrock, enriching it in valuable metals. This circulation of hot fluids severely alters the nearby rocks. Thus, geologists will often look for this type of alteration as a clue that there may be copper nearby. Once geologists are certain that there is a good potential for valuable economic deposits to be in a certain area, they will begin a more targeted reconnaissance missions. This stage can involve some quick sample collecting and analysis, geologic mapping, airborne surveys, and geophysical surveys. The geophysical surveys tools developed in modern times are a powerful way to quickly determine whether an area is a likely source of valuable deposits. These methods look for variations in gravity, magnetism, and seismic behavior. Since the majority of magnetic mineral deposits are more dense than the average bedrock, all of these methods are basically looking for physical anomalies that may suggest that a dense, metal-rich deposit is present at depth. Other survey tools, such as magnetic surveys, allow geologists to map the underlying structures of the Earth. If an exploration team is tracking a particular geologic unit, they may want a magnetic survey to understand the underlying structures in the area. Once our geologist teams have targeted a specific area for having all of the required clues of valuable mineral deposits, they then begin a greater detailed investigation into the economic potential of the area. As we learned in a different lesson in this course, we only care about mineral deposits because they have economic potential in our society, meaning they are useful enough to become valuable. One way we classify the economic potential of a mineral deposit is by determining its grade. Grade is the concentration of the metal in a body of rock and is normally expressed as a percent. It can be understood as the amount of metal per unit rock. For instance, if a deposit has 50 pounds of copper for 1,000 pounds of rock, the grade would be 0.05, or 5%. But how do geologists estimate this grade before they start mining? We know they have already chosen an area that is a likely target and have performed geophysical surveys. The next step is to actually begin to drill holes into the earth to test whether their hypotheses are correct. These samples are rigorously logged and examined by geologists for the present of valuable mineralization or further clues. Cores will be drilled at multiple locations surrounding and within the target area to allow geologists to best pinpoint the exact location of the deposit. Imagine that you are trying to locate the extent of filling in a jelly donut using only a straw. Each time you pull out the straw, you'd either have just donut or layer donut and jelly. By poking the donut multiple times, you could eventually figure out where the edges of the jelly are within the donut. In much the same way, geologists have to drill these cores to probe inside the earth and learn where the boundaries of the deposit are. Using these samples, and hopefully some recovered ore samples, geologists can then begin to estimate the extent of the deposit and the grade of the ore. Only large deposits with a higher percentage of ore have the best chance of resulting in actual mining development and production. Because some metals are so valuable, grades below 1% can still be worthwhile mining investments. When a resource is confidently located and the ore grade has been assessed, companies then begin to plan their mining operations. Since most mines are located in remote areas, Beginning a new operation is a huge endeavor that requires building infrastructure, bringing in earth-moving equipment, and building roads and power sources. While the resource exploration is performed by trained geologists, the actual mine development and operations are overseen by mining engineers, who are trained to design safe and effective ways to best extract a deposit. You've likely seen the intricate pit mines that are dug deeper and deeper into the earth. 
These must be carefully planned and designed so that workers can safely extract as much valuable ore as possible. Production occurs when the minerals are being extracted from the earth and refined into the valuable raw materials that we require. As you can tell, it's a long process to get to the point of actually mining the materials from the earth. Despite all of the mines that have been active throughout time, there are innumerable failed exploration projects that did not result in final resource production. In this lesson, we learn that there are three main stages that make up mineral exploration projects. These include target identification and investigation, where geologists must choose and narrow down an area that is likely to contain mineral deposits. They do this by examining existing maps and data, performing reconnaissance surveys, and looking for clues such as alteration. The next stage is resource evaluation, where geologists extract samples from the region by drilling into the earth to better understand the nature and location of the deposit. The final stage is development and production, which is the building of the mine and extraction of the mineral deposit. Bon, donc la leçon est finie. The, the, le the lesson is finished for this week. Um, so the next one will be in two weeks, will be the geochemical surveys. So thank you for being here. Oh, okay, t'es de retour. Uh, just, before, uh, just before we go, uh, we uh, might uh, want to uh, share a uh, question uh, earlier, earlier uh, in the uh, French version of the webinar. Um, Someone was inquiring about a uh, huge machinery that uh, we need to move in remote places to do geophysical surveys. So how do people go about moving said machinery in remote places? To, for uh, remote places, the, the machinery, uh, depending on the size, but if it's great, uh, big equipment, it's mainly uh, brought into pieces by helicopter to uh, far uh, zones. Um, uh, first, uh, the surveys are done either with smaller scale equipment and if we require bigger scale, well, they're brought in by helicopter. Okay, and as we discussed earlier as well, uh, I think when people are surveying, they're they doing in steps, given that it is expensive. So say you have to move this type of machinery using helicopters, you might want to figure out first, is this place worth surveying? So I, yeah. I think you mentioned that uh, companies will do it in steps, like a small step and a bigger step, then a bigger step moving in machinery and stuff. Yeah, that was another question we had. With another great question is, um, there are different uh, types of companies. Uh, if you have a junior company, uh, they will either do their in-house small surveys, but they cannot be used within uh, standard uh, normalized uh, 43101 reports. And we, you have consulting companies, uh, geophysician companies that will go and do the professional surveys that will be used within the standardized uh, 43101 reports. Um, and being a small uh, junior company, um, lower budgets means um, companies will use geophysics for data-driven areas, but once they want to have uh, advanced interpretations, they will hire uh, geophysical companies with uh, geophysical interpretations because the key thing here is a geologist cannot interpret geological, geophysical data. They can use the interpreted data, they cannot interpret it themselves. So it's really important to understand that. Same as uh, the next lesson within the geochemical uh, surveys, we each have our domain. Um, I can interpret some geophysical data for my own use, in-house use, or geological interpretation, but I need to have it validated by a professional geophysician. 
because everything we've seen today, we've seen the techniques, we've seen the methods, we've seen what they, what they are used for, but we haven't seen the background. Everything that has to do with geo, geophysi geophysics is mathematical. So everything that is interpreted is using uh, um, very powerful softwares and a geophysician has to be behind to confirm the uh, interpretations, basically. I didn't want to go through uh, the formulas and the mathematics that I don't think it's relevant for understanding the use of geophysics surveys. Yeah, it might be a little too much of heavy lifting for us. Yeah, for me too. <laughs> Non-initiated non peoples. Uh, yeah. So I think we'll wrap it up today for this uh, fifth installment of our webinar series. Thanks again for everyone who stuck with us and for the interesting questions that we had at the end. Uh, thank you, Francine, for this deep dive, especially at the end. It was really interesting to cover that information. Once again, if you guys have any uh, further questions, uh, if you watch this during one of our uh, reruns on YouTube, feel free to email us at info at iddpnql.ca. Uh, we'll grab all those questions and send them to Francine and send those answers right back to you. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks for the sixth installment where we will uh, cover geochemical surveys. Until exactly. then, have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.